European abstract expressionism was more controlled, more finished. The American art had a different look. I'd say that we had um, looser surfaces, let's call it that. You felt a freshness and a kind of uh, emphasis. I don't want to say violence. That word's been misused in this connection. Franz Klein drew inspiration from Cubism. Willem de Kooning did portraits that became highly charged responses to the women who were his models. The abstract expressionists wanted to paint on the same level of quality as the old masses or as, let's say, the best of the school of Paris. Picasso, Matisse, Mondrian. They were striving for excellence. And they found that they did better work when they went abstract. Mark Rothko chose a path to pure expression by using only gradations of color on his canvases. Pollock's vision and Greenberg's theory were explored by a second generation. Many acknowledged that Helen Frankenthaler adapted Pollock's technique in a way that made him more accessible to other artists. She stained her canvas with highly diluted paint to achieve these haunting effects in mountains and sea. The abstract expressionist movement dominated the world of Western art for over a decade. By the mid-50s, they were established, only to be superseded by a new avant-garde. The post-war world is characterized by an acceleration of speed, speed of travel, of information, of communication, indeed, speed of change itself, and a style which in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance took decades to work itself out could now run its course in a year or even less. And in such a culture, saturated with objects, with advertising, packaging, and TV, it was inevitable that art itself should not merely reflect this, but in a sense, become the object. For if the content mattered so little in comparison with the packaging, then why not use a Coke bottle or a soup tin? The young generation then taught that not only was art unheroic, it was anywhere and could be anything. Robert Rauschenberg's use of Coke bottles, a spare tire, a goat, shocked his audience. If this is art, said one abstract expressionist, I quit. What's very curious in the history of art is that often the moments where something really decisive happens to change that history, those moments are not terribly perceptible to their contemporaries and only become perceptible in retrospect. And I think that one of these moments occurred, at least for our modern sensibilities, with the work of Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. This is a Rauschenberg called Trophy Three. What Rauschenberg does is to insist that the surface of the canvas is no longer a window into which we look, or through which we look, a window that opens onto another world, as, say, this little porthole that I'm looking through that opens onto the skyline of New York. I can see the Empire State Building through it. Rather, what we have is the surface of the canvas as a horizontal field, like a desktop, like the, like the working surface uh, of somebody's studio or somebody's writing table, onto which junk is piled. Mail, postcards, posters, advertisements, records, magazines, newspapers. A kind of tremendous clutter of banal experience that interpolates even great art into that clutter. As here in Rauschenberg's Small Rebus.
Rauschenberg went on to build a wall of information by silkscreening photographic images onto canvas, as in this work called Port Arthur, Texas. The result is that everything here is homogenized in the uniform surface of photographic information. We may think of photography as a realistic medium, but Rauschenberg shows it as a single, flattened informational field, as flat as the screens of our television sets or the front pages of our newspapers. One of the things that happens in Jasper Johns's work is that he makes the image that's projected inside the canvas synonymous with the surface of the canvas. There is no more interior space in the image. The target, the American flag, are manifestly, absolutely on the surface of the canvas. Johns is being ironic about earlier pictorial subjects like portraits or still lives or landscapes. This painting, based on Buckminster Fuller's map of the world, is an ironic landscape, flattened to match the modern tourist's impression of space. By refusing illusion, Johns was making some sort of comment about the nature of modern experience. 